when you are more intentional, you have a much greater opportunity to not only provide great service to the people that you're working with, but also to design a life that um, really speaks to your own joy and your own impact. Hi, Alex. Welcome to Owning Your Legacy. And if you wouldn't mind, can you do an uh, introduction for our listeners? Yes, I'm Alex Johnston, the founder and president of Building Impact Partners, a philanthropy advising practice. And I would love you to share your story of how you knew this was your calling and really your purpose in life, because I think uh, it was a zig and zagged road to get here, but a very interesting one. Well, thank you so much for having me. And that is such a beautiful, expansive question to start a conversation. <laughs> um, and for me, now that I'm I'm past uh, a half century here, you know, thinking about my calling is is actually something that I do quite a bit. Um, you know, reflecting on, I, I will feel blessed, um, but I know I'm I'm in the second half of my life now. And mm, you uh, and me both, it's a great place to be. <laughs> So I think the story of, you know, how it is that I focus on philanthropy and, and helping people give money away, it actually goes back um, probably to being in high school and, and really just having the sense that the world and in particular the United States, you know, there's so much promise and yet there's so much potential that we leave undeveloped, whether it's people or opportunities for making the world a better place. And so I just became really fascinated about how we all in, engage with each other and how society works. And that actually led me to focus on housing first. I was also really interested in building houses and uh, yeah. one was a licensed uh, contractor, but I got very involved in Habitat for Humanity uh, when I was in college and, and in grad school. I started the first campus chapter of Habitat for Humanity when I was in England. And Ooh. that led me um, back to New Haven, Connecticut. I grew up in Western Massachusetts. And, you know, I spent 10 years in the affordable housing space and ended up as director of operations at a housing authority. And at that time, I had a really good friend who was starting a school called Amistad Academy, a charter school in New Haven, Connecticut. And I saw the kids in that school, and they were many of the same kids that were in the communities that I was involved in, in the housing authority. Mm -hmm. And I just realized, wow, you know, as much good as we're doing here, helping people have a, a place to live, education has even more potential uh, to be a transformative force. Yes. And so I spent about seven years as an advocate around education issues. Mm -hmm. And then I made a transition into philanthropy. And for me, this is all the same thing. <laughs> you know, it's You're all right. about trying to make the world a better place. Um, but just through, and, I guess I feel like I've been getting closer to my point of greatest leverage in my journey. Oh, that's a good way to say it, greatest leverage. And you know, I believe you and Pete Cadence know each other, um, Hope Chicago. So his his huge platform is around education. So that made me, made me think of him, of he feels like that's really, you got to start at the root cause and to to make impact. Um, and I love the whole concept of your book, which we definitely have to dive into. And I have to show the book that we have right here. Um, but really, it's great for not only ultra donors, I think is the way you call it, but I think just everyday people. And you talk about finding fulfillment in philanthropy and not focusing too much on just impact. But even even, um, even before we go there, though, I think it's it was cool how you said you were an unconscious entrepreneur. So I'd love to hear you kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that phrase really resonates for me because when I transitioned from leading a nonprofit to beginning to work in the philanthropy advising space, I actually didn't have an intention to start a business necessarily. I just wanted to help donors, particularly in education, mm -hmm. be more effective in their giving to make a greater difference. And, and because I knew a lot about the education space, I wanted to focus on helping donors in that space. But I also realized that I, practically speaking, I needed to create an entity that, you know, I could operate as a consultant from. And so that was an LLC that I created in 2012. And for the first year or two that I was advising donors, I was so focused on actually just doing the work of advising. I gave very little thought to the fact that I had actually created a company and I was now for the first time in, in my career running a business. Well, actually that's not true. I, I, you know, 
had a lawn mowing and house painting business when I was in uh, <laughs> high school and college. But I, I don't There's know. There's that, that I, entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, so right maybe, there. maybe it does go back a little longer. But but I I gave no thought to um, the actual journey of of building a business and. That phrase resonates a lot for me now because we actually run a training program called Advisors Accelerator for other philanthropy advisors now. And we talk with people who are solopreneurs about this journey because, I mean, for me, it I probably spent five or six years without really thinking about working on my business. Mm. I was just working in my business. And, you know, it's not that that's a lost opportunity. It's all part of the journey. But when you are more intentional, you have a much greater opportunity to not only provide great service to the people that you're working with, but also to design a life that um, really speaks to your own joy and your own impact. And lives for others, you know, as your employees and really leadership is a complex animal. And I, I one thing I learned uh, as you were talking about that, I think I was listening to one of your other podcasts, was the difference that if you did a nonprofit for your business that you wouldn't be able to advise people on political matters. That really struck me because I feel ignorant on political matters. And I think it's a lane that's important that you can do. And I never knew that the difference that if you were a non-for-profit that you couldn't do that. But I think I, I, I cannot be alone in feeling ignorant on political, like knowing, and you said, sophisticated donors. So you said something really cool about sophisticated donors do use politics to make a difference and to make an impact because of that strong engine there. So yeah. talk, talk a little bit about that if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a tough topic, I think for a lot of us, because politics often feels dirty. It feels broken. And, you know, I think with the increasing partisanship and polarization in our country and even in the world right now, many of us just... <laughs> We just almost despair when it's we're- It's paralyzing, right? I, I get paralyzed. That's what I would say. The most engaged folks, interest groups, donors, otherwise, they know that whether politics is dirty, it isn't broken. Meaning that um, there are people who are engaging very significantly to shape our political process and they're using money to do it. And so when I talk to donors, if there's a donor who, whatever the issue is that they care about, whether education, it's uh, education, yeah. mm -hmm. food safety, uh, food security, whatever it might be. Right. If you sort of say, hey, you know what? I just want to stay out of this arena. I just want to help people directly. That's a, That's great work to do. However, you may be leaving a lot of systemic change on the table. You may be not getting down to the root cause if you leave in place a system of policies that perpetuates whatever the challenge is that you are interested in working with. And so that's actually literally a big motiv motivation for why I got into philanthropy advising in the first place, because I had worked as an advocate in a state capital and I saw how policy got made and I was shocked by it, honestly. Really? I mean, the idealism I had going in, when you get into those rooms, when the door closes and, you know, um, the room where it happens, as the <laughs> that song from the Hamilton musical says, yeah. it, it's kind of like, it's just raw power and, and, um, realizing like, hey, you know what? You have to be really careful if you as a donor are going to try to intervene. And a lot of us feel like, hey, we shouldn't have money in politics. But I, from my standpoint, the money is already there. And I don't see an immediate prospect for changing that. I'm interested in looking at those solutions too. But in the meantime, if you don't choose to engage, you're leaving the playing field open to the people who are already there, already shaping the system in a ways that don't work for many of the people that you may be trying to help. That's really interesting that that's how those decisions and policies are made. I would not just in a room, you know, that's, that's really kind of alarming a little bit, but yeah, I had Pete and his wife um, on the podcast and Amy was talking about um, diapers and, and it sounds just so simple. Like it was just shocking to me that you can't use, any of the government help, food stamps or what have you to get diapers. Did not know that. That seems ridiculously stupid. And she went on to say how then women can't work because if you can't afford diapers, you can't bring your child to daycare. You can't like the trickle effect of that is yeah. insane. And that seems like the simplest thing. Yeah. And 
such a great example of a root cause, right? Right. So let's dig into your book a little bit. One part that I, I found really interesting when you were talking about behaviors and um, and in the, I, I can't remember how you described it, but that, you know, it, to be a good steward of money, but we don't talk about money and there's this like avoidance culture and we don't talk about it with our children. And I, I found that one really intriguing. And I'd love you to kind of describe that, the, the behaviors that we all get stuck in. Yeah, there's a great book uh, written by a wealth psychologist, Dr. James Grubman. It's called Strangers in Paradise. And I know we're here to talk about my book, but I got to tell you, <laughs> this is a great book, the one that he wrote. Um, and what he, what he really realized was that for many people who have, whatever level of wealth they may have, they didn't grow up the same way. We have this idea that, you know, wealth is passed down from one generation to the next. And certainly that happens. But for people who are what you call ultra high net worth, people with $30 million or more, the statistics on this are really fascinating. And it, and it really surprised me when I looked into it. The first thing is that 75% of those folks made that money themselves in their own lifetimes which means they started out in working or middle-class origins. And, and so that's why he uses this um, immigration metaphor, a journey to the land of wealth. And there's an issue of cultural assimilation when you arrive in this land of wealth because you didn't grow up in this same circumstance. And you don't have to be ultra high net worth to be navigating these same challenges. Totally agree. This is, I agree. It's the statistics are crazy on the ultra high net worth, but, but I feel like this resonates with everybody. I think many of us, regardless of our level of wealth, are growing up, are raising kids in circumstances that are different than the ones we grew up in ourselves. And that difference is magnified that much more for people who are ultra high net worth. And it's actually very disorienting for them and their kids, especially because they often turn to their giving as a place where they want to come together around their shared values. And yet the younger generation is growing up in a different set of circumstances and their values were shaped in a different context and different relationship to wealth. And so one reason that this matters so much, I mean, it matters to all of us, but to the ultra wealthy, um, they actually fail to pass on their wealth to their kids at a much greater sort of uh, percentage than the rest of us do, meaning that it's much more likely that their kids will not have the same level of affluence that they did. Interesting. Talk more about that. Why is why is that? Well, it, it is because of this cultural issue that if you grow up working in middle, middle class, guess what you don't do in your house very much? You don't talk about money. And if you do talk about money, you're probably having a fight about it. Yeah. <laughs> you're not right. talking about how do we as a family creatively manage and give away money, but also sort of run our family businesses, et cetera. Right. That's why there's a whole raft of consultants out there that work on multi-generation family businesses because it's super tricky. It is super tricky. And I am I am one of those. I am, I'd call it, I'm second generation. And again, like I mentioned, I have five boys, which will be the the next generation. And I, I love this topic. It's just timely for me because I um, had one offsite meeting and I do have an advisor and a facilitator that helps with this, with with my kids. And we did an offsite meeting and started with values. So exactly where you were going, we had to determine, you know, what our independent individual values were. Because um, you do, you need like a mission statement of your family, of what you know, what is the intention? And he was guiding them a lot on the difference between earning money and and being given money. It was a great, and just talking about it, just like you said, just talking about it is the biggest first step in not making it so taboo. Because I grew up, yeah. just like you said, my dad was very generous, but he, he you don't talk about it. You never talk about it. It's a secret. Mm -hmm. And I think that's huge. Yeah. And, you know, that um, almost like <laughs> not wanting to connect with your wealth makes it really hard to have the conversations that you need to have about whether you want to pass it on in your family or give it all away. You talk about that, you know, what can your money do? What is the purpose of it? Um, and I think that's just it's deep thoughts. I mean, those are deep questions. Yeah. yeah. And and again, because so many people who have the resources to be philanthropic grew up with a kind of a cultural relationship with wealth where it wasn't something you talked about and where you wouldn't want- Do you want think people feel guilty? 
Do you think there's a guilt component? I, I think I could see that. I think there is. I think there's also a fear component because yeah. in our society, affluence is, we have a complicated relationship with it, right? If you think about reality TV and, and we put so much cultural emphasis on sort of celebrating or, or looking at the lives of the rich and famous, and yet we also have a lot of judgment. And, um, and so I think there's a, a fear that some wealthy people have that they don't want their children to be viewed as the recipients of, you know, something they didn't earn. And, and so they don't want their kids to talk about it. Um, and they want to, and there's some families that even don't tell their kids. I mean, this, this sounds extreme, but there are families who never discuss money. The, the parents have made tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. They put it in trust for their kids and the kids don't even know, even adult children, um, because they're trying to shield them from what they view as the corrupting influence of wealth. I kind of get that though, a little bit because only around the concept of maybe it's not good that they know so that they know they have to work. They have to create their own dreams and their own life. So if they knew they had X amount of million in a trust or what have you, and when they're, and when they're younger, they think, oh, I can live on that for the rest of my life. And you're like, no, really, it's, you need more than that to, to do that. And you have to, I'm, I, at least speaking for myself, I just, I want my kids to find their passion and their calling in life. And feel yeah. like, and and use that absolutely use that wealth for good, you know. So yeah, and there's certainly for ultra wealthy families, there's an opportunity for the family philanthropy to become almost a uh, a business. A business, yes, the way I love in which that. The the rising generation finds a purpose and really, you know, there's another great book called The Quest for Legitimacy, which is about, you know, the children of ultra wealthy folks growing up in the land of giants and having to define their own path and and how hard that is. And, you know, in our society, we don't necessarily have a lot of sympathy for, you know, ultra wealthy folks. Cry me a river, you know, you're so privileged. Right, right. But I think there's actually a lot of pain and um, and challenge in in growing up in those circumstances. And so without yeah, dwelling on that too much, I, I think it, it's, it, it does play an important role in philanthropy and and because philanthropy, giving back, can be a way in which the family finds sort of a uh, a way to connect with others through the you know around the topic of of money, and that you know that that's really why I wrote the book because right. there's so much money that's sitting on the sidelines. The the wealthiest hundred thousand Americans collectively have eleven trillion dollars, and when we think about how much money is sitting in foundations, it's only a tenth of that. It's one point three trillion. So privately held wealth that that people may have an intention to give away, but they haven't actually done that uh, is a huge resource. And, um, you know, in a world that's literally and figuratively on fire, there's a lot of opportunity for people to find meaning and purpose in the process of of giving back. And it's not just the ultra wealthy too. All of us can, right. can really benefit from, and from that's giving. why what you do is so important. Um, and I love you, you were saying, Oh, there was that one podcast you were on that I'm like, oh, I want my kids to watch it. It was the father son, um, decisive, deci uh, decidedly, yeah, decidedly. That yeah, was great that yeah. was really good, really, really good. Um, but you were talking about the goal is social impact and fulfillment when they come together for meaningful giving, um, like that, because you do get. You were saying, you know, impact. I, I say that all the time. It. I want to give where there's impact, but it can paralyze you again, you know, on, like you say, some people just step out of out of philanthropy altogether because they get too stuck on the metrics. So yeah. I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I, I th thank you for raising that. I think one, a reason that I, I wrote the book and is that one of the reasons people hang back from giving is sort of ironic, but we get so focused on this idea that we need to know for sure that we're making the biggest possible difference that we can with our giving, that it becomes like another job, like the pressure that you feel. And interestingly, most of us who give are checkbook philanthropists. We have a cause, someone asks us, we give to our faith community, and we don't worry about measuring whether it's making a difference. Most of us, we just write that check and we move on. And in some cases, we never even circle back. And 
the, and a reason for that is that sort of psychologically, like we think, oh, well, you know, I'm only giving this much, so it doesn't really matter. Or I'm giving to the Red Cross and they're a big organization and everyone else does the same, so it's fine. But there's a certain point for people, usually when the check size gets big enough <laughs> that they start to say, wait a minute, I just wrote a $100,000 check and I can't, I don't feel it's not responsible for me to give without making sure that this is really making a difference. And that's interestingly where the trouble starts for some people because they don't want to hire a philanthropy advisor. They don't want to staff up a foundation. They really just want to keep giving, but psychologically they haven't given themselves permission to give and not measure the impact. And so they get stuck. And, and, Again, this book is really intended to be like a DIY guide for people who get stuck in that situation um, to actually start some reflection exercises about what is really meaningful for them. So, Because I'm not worried that your money isn't going to make a difference in the world. There are so many extraordinary organizations and extraordinary leaders and important causes out there. I'm much more worried that you as a donor won't actually figure out what's fulfilling for you and give yourself permission to pursue your own fulfillment alongside impact. And I know that might sound self-indulgent, but when you focus only on impact and you're not actually building a structure and, and pursuing a strategy to measure impact, then you're gonna, you're gonna give a lot less because you're gonna feel unsure. Whereas if you focus on your values and what's really important to you, you're going to end up connecting with people who are extraordinary, who you really believe in, who you know are making a difference with your money, and you're going to feel much better about it in the process. I love that. And in your book, I'd love you to touch on the decision tree because that is a that it seems like can be used for anything, not even just giving, but it seems like a really powerful tool. Yeah, yeah, we have a whole uh, kind of critical decision making toolkit um, that allows people, you know, to walk through. And yes, you're calling on your rational faculties to make decisions for sure, but you also need to reflect on your psychology and, and give yourself permission to seek your own fulfillment. And I think that, you know, a lot of times, ironically, we come to our giving with this idea, especially if we've accumulated a level of wealth that we're not entirely comfortable with, mm -hmm. that we are, there's sort of this moral element to it for us that, um, you know, it's it. We're worried about being self-indulgent, and this is also because in our culture, there's a lot of criticism of giving gone wrong, and there's a lot of critiques of philanthropy, some of which are very well justified. And right. so, it's very easy for donors, especially if they feel like you know I'm giving millions of dollars now, for them to be worried that they're going to be judged, and that you know, if, boy, if they give to something that other people say wasn't impactful, you know, shame on them. Right. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I think one of the biggest you know, pieces of advice in the book is connection, relationship. Find organizations and people that you're interested in and build a relationship with them. And when you get behind those individuals, you know these nonprofit social entrepreneurs, they've dedicated their lives to the thing that they're working on. And the chance that they're gonna take you for a ride or defraud you, it's, it's so small. And you know, bad people are out there in every walk of life, but you know, the, the worry that somehow your money is going to be wasted is is often misplaced. Um, not not in every case, and I'm not saying just hey, you know, send someone millions of dollars and and don't worry about it. But if you get engaged and build a relationship with an organization and a cause that you believe in, you can have a lifetime of fulfillment, and your money can start making a difference right now instead of waiting, 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 putting it off like a kitchen renovation project you never get to. Right. And meanwhile, you know, whatever it is you you care about in the world, it your money is needed now. And I think you also brought up the point that it's not always money. I mean, sometimes it's your connections, it's your time. It's, I mean, there's so many ways to get that fulfillment. We, yeah. um, we love Gigi's gala is one of the, one of the, so it's um, down syndrome. So Nancy Gianni's her daughter's Gigi, and she started this amazing um, Gigi's playhouses around the world. Now she's, I think she's in like 40 countries and um, just feels so just, going to the gala and you get to dance with the kids and like really connect with the kids. It sounds so silly, but it lights you up. You know, you feel like this is why, why yeah. we believe in this one, you know? Yeah. And, and so giving to something that has that personal connection. Right. When you believe in the person and I really believe in her. Um, so that really, that, that truly does help. And you talked about the different, I don't, I can't remember all of it, but it was almost like kind of soulless giving like, like you had some different 
talk about that a little bit because that 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 kind of struck me because I'm like I love the gala now I feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, in the one of the opening chapters of the book, um, there's this graphic. It's like a two by two, and the idea is that meaningful giving is where you're maximizing social impact and fulfillment for the donor, and that's what we all aspire to. But there's also selfish giving where you're just gratifying yourself and you're really not benefiting anyone else. There's spiritless giving where you get so focused on impact that you leave aside relationships and anything that's really fulfilling for you. And then that leads us to the third category, which you could think of as senseless giving where, you know what, I don't enjoy it as the donor and I'm not making any difference out in the world. And mm -hmm. you say, why in the world would anybody do that? Well, a lot of people get stuck where they get involved in, and this is where I mentioned galas, right? Um, because if you get invited to one and then you go, and then it's sort of like, sometimes it gets to be this reciprocal thing that becomes overwhelming where your calendar fills up and maybe there are causes that you don't really have a relationship or connection to. And so it's not uncommon for us to find donors who are looking for relief <laughs> from that situation where their money has been spread out across many, many things. Right. But the- the gala that you described is very different, right? Because you have a connection there. It is meaningful to you. And you know that your money is making a difference. That's yeah. the sweet spot. She also um, works on having like work opportunities for the young adults in the program. And we're working on getting, you know, there's a lot of jobs at Edlong that they can do in the sample room or in our lab. And, and really that lights up me and our employees. Our employees love that too, you know, and it's just, it brings a different energy and a different light to the place, you know? So yeah, again, well, back, it's not always money, you know? Yeah. I mean, all of us need that sense of purpose and there are so many ways that we can contribute. It's, it, you're right. It's not just money. It's ideas. It's cultural capital, political capital, social capital, physical capital. Right. You know, Habitat kinds. for humanity, building houses. Yeah, like, yeah. I think that's awesome. So kind of walk me through if I were to you know, sign up to be one of your clients? Like, how does that go? Well, I appreciate that question. And, you know, I think we at Building Impact Partners have been in business for about a dozen years now. And over that time period, we've helped our clients give away over a billion dollars now. And so- Congratulations. That is, that's huge. I mean, you should be proud of yourself. That is very, very cool. Cool number. Well, I'm very appreciative of the donors that we've worked with and and their commitment to putting their resources out into the world. And it has been, a, it does feel like a privilege to, to work with them. And, you know, typically when we're talking with folks who are thinking about gearing up their giving, we, we really walk through some of the frameworks, you know, that, that just, it's, it's common sense, but that doesn't mean that it's common practice. And really helping people reflect on their values, their vision, and their why behind their giving. Um, because a lot of times people, the question that people come to us with is because of their own journey of giving, they've often been a checkbook philanthropist. And then as their economic circumstances have transformed, suddenly they find themselves with what they now view as a problem, which is I have more money to give away now on an annual basis than I feel comfortable giving away just writing checks. And so I need help. I need to know that my money is making a difference on the things I really care about. And, and so that's often where we start the conversation. But in order to unpack that, we often have to go a little bit further back. Um, and sometimes people do come to us with a very tactical problem and we're consultants and we'll come in and we'll help them solve that. That's interesting to know. Like, I'm, honestly, I'm sure I could think of 10 other things like that, but um, you can come to you tactically and say, this is something I'd really want to make a difference on and you, you guys would advise. Yeah, yeah, literally, because sometimes it is as simple as connecting someone with a social entrepreneur or sometimes even someone who's running a for-profit business that um, is providing the opportunity to scale a solution in an area that someone cares about. And so we certainly work on you know what's called the impact investing. That's not our core focus, but um, we certainly do work with donors who are interested in putting resources to work in creative ways, not just pure philanthropy, but sometimes capitalizing or, you know, catalytic capital to get something going that, that accelerates some change in the marketplace. That's interesting. We, we talk about uh, food heroes uh, around here, a lot of, you know, legacy, not only legacy of individuals, but what's the legacy of this food industry? Cause that's our, our passion and where we live. And, and there's so, um, so much need and so much talk about sustainability and, the population and, you know, we don't have enough to 
to feed everybody in the future. So, so I, I, that just kind of intrigued me on that thought of, you know, thinking of some of the emerging companies or even, um, even longstanding companies that are coming up with, you know, you feed this cow this and it helps with the methane or just mm-hmm. creative innovations out there yeah. that I, I could imagine some of your clients would be like, wait, I care about that. And yeah. tell me, tell me who's working on things like that. And for people who, who are running active businesses, there's a beautiful opportunity sometimes to explore the way you operate the business. There's a guy, for example, in Australia, uh, Andrew Forrest, who's a mining entrepreneur, and he is ma- he's maxed out his R&D budget in his company. He's spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to figure out how can we produce carbon neutral steel you know, and concrete? Um, and how can we re-engineer the process of getting these minerals out of the ground and you know through foundries and and then um, mm-hmm. reduce the carbon footprint of that? And so certainly there are, it's not the case in every instance that you know everything you want to accomplish philanthropically you can do through the way you run your business. But um, mm-hmm. for a lot of people, there's opportunity there that they haven't fully considered. Yeah, and I think there's always so much money and grants and foundations that a lot of us don't even know. I remember just stumbling on one years ago at Edlong and it was around trade shows, but we ended up getting the grant, but I, I, like who knew that was even there? Like there's just, they hide it. <laughs> it feels like there's secrets and yeah, there's a lot of money that like you say, just sits on the sidelines and doesn't get used for what it was intended for. Just yeah. frustrating. And, and I do think that um, for individual donors, the, this question of measuring impact does become, you know, an obstacle, but it's, yeah. it's not the only challenge that, uh, that people face. I think there's also just the, how do I make time in my life? You know, this, this concern that this will take so much time. And again, I think we have, we have this idea that the sort of the best way to do your giving if you're operating at a certain scale is to create your own strategy, measurement, metrics, milestones, and all of that. And that just is very intensive. And and for a lot of people, that's not appealing. And so, you know, in the book, there are six alternatives to what strategic philanthropy, to like making your own strategy. And most of them involve things like, you know, we call it wings with no strings, uh, what Mackenzie Scott has done, um, you know, where she has and um, after her uh, divorce with Jeff Bezos, she had about $60 billion. And in the first two, three years of working with that resource, she gave away $12 billion. Wow. And I did. pretty much did it. Um, she really sort of drew people's attention because she didn't create a foundation. She hired uh, some folks to help her, some advisors. And then they went out. Was it you? Did it, what did you no, get? No, it's to- not <laughs> us. It's uh, Bridgespan. Um, one of the, one of the larger companies. Um, and, and they, you know, she said, these are four or five issues I care about. And then that advisory team went out and, you know, found organizations that were doing great work. And she basically just said, almost no diligence. We already know we have a track record. Here's, you know, let's back up the dump truck, dump out the cash, one-time gift, $7 million, $12 million. It's not, you know, it's not that everyone should give in that same way, but it's just an example of how you don't have to spend a lot of time to make a big difference. And, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, that that people overlook because they have in their mind that this would have to be like a part-time job in order for- Right. Them. That's well, that's huge. Time. Time is everything. And it's, uh, I think that is absolutely the value and the gift that you bring in, in your business is taking that off somebody else's plate and, and doing the research for them and making them feel good about- where they're putting their money. And I, I love that you say we're all kind of looking for significance. I think that's a great word, yeah. um, which is very true. And I, I think we're coming up to our time, but I, I would love to, uh, I would love to hear how you, and you kind of touched on a little bit, but how you instill that in your children. Cause it, it just seems like with what you do, I'm just curious how your kids, what's their take, what's their values, what do you know, describe them a little bit for us. Yeah, well, I have three boys um, between the ages of almost nine and and thirteen, and you know I think uh, our faith community is important to us um, because that is you know I grew up um, going to church and I like many folks you know in college and grad school sort of drifted away, but 
when my wife and I first met, um, it was important to us to find a church community that we could be a part of. And that is not the only way uh, to sort of express those values. But I think what I've realized in raising kids is that having a care, a community of caring adults, other people that they can see and interact with who are acting out the values that we as parents have is really important because yeah. no matter what example you set for your kids, they actually pay, I mean, they do pay a lot of attention to that, but they get, they pay so much attention to who else is in your life and, yeah, and what values they have. And so for me, um, you know, uh, we're part of St. Bart's uh, in New York City, which is uh, just an amazing uh, church community. And that's been uh, an important part of, of our journey. Mm -hmm. and, and then I would also say that, you know, my wife works at the United Nations and, and you know, I do the work that I do in philanthropy advising. And so our dinner table conversation sometimes like- I bet they're very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are, there are threads in There's that. no light talk. It's all like really- <laughs> deep conversation. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of that too, but yeah. um, there are certainly threads around just like the stuff that she and I are doing every day um, right. that the kids can pick up on as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But I would also say that like, you know, you can't be a prophet in your own land. And, you know, I'm a coach. I spend a lot of time, you know, working on my own psychology and uh, parenting is just a, a challenge. Just, yeah. So you're a personal coach. Like, is that what you mean my coach? Yeah. Yeah, so oh, I, cool. I've been on my own personal growth journey for about seven years now. And yeah. uh, as part of that, I, I really began coaching some of the donors that we advise because yeah. I think when you find something that's transformative for yourself, uh, you yeah. know, you can't help but share it. And um, it's not that I coach every donor we work with for sure, but yeah. um, I think that the journey of personal growth is so fundamental to this finding of meaning in, in everything so true. we are giving. And so I just didn't want to leave that. And it's work, it. right? It's definitely yeah. work. And I think it yeah. never, never ends quite and, frankly. And actually all four partners in our business are trained coaches. Uh, nice. So it's, it's really woven into the way that we approach our work um, yeah. and, and how we come at the, the work of philanthropy and philanthropy advising. And there was one other comment, you said something around like, it transcends us. It's a higher that you were comparing, you know, fear and scarcity versus yeah. when you do give, it's like, it is kind of like spiritual or, yeah. you know, I, I, yeah. I, it's, I think it's, you know, giving is a little bit like breathing, you know, what breathing is the one part of our autonomic nervous system that we consciously control. Mm -hmm. And therefore when you do breath work, you can really connect your mind and your body in powerful ways. And I, I think of giving in a somewhat similar way, meaning that you can give intentionally, right? And and all of us have to give just to, to function unless we're a sociopath. Like we are giving in myriad ways as we go through our day. But when you really focus intentionally on your giving, it can have this transformative effect because you can meet many psychological needs by giving to others. And you grow yourself, you expand yourself, you really transcend your own you know, we're all, we all live in our heads and our thoughts just, you know, that train of thought, that incessant train of thought can um, really be the source of so much suffering. And when we shift our focus away from that inward and start um, reflecting on how we can help others more deeply, mm -hmm. it's incredibly liberating. It does feel incredibly good. I mean, we all know it. You, I mean, even if it's, I love the little, you know, pay for the car behind you in Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And I've had that happen to me. And I'm like, that just made my day. Like just the littlest things that just yeah. can uh, really light you up. And and you know, it's it's the right thing to do. So yeah, I, I think of those as micro affirmations, like yeah, just smiling yeah. at somebody. Yes. Expecting it. Um, Even like, especially for women. Oh my God, I love your outfit. Like, <laughs> it's just the littlest thing, but you're like, thank you. You know, that just made my day or yeah, yeah. it is yeah. very true. And I, I love what you said about who we surround ourselves with and that our children see that. I think that that's very, very true. They, um, they're watching. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So on to the last question. So I would love to hear, which is, I have a feeling it's going to be very profound, but what is the legacy that you would like to leave behind? Yeah, that is, I love that question. And I love the whole way you frame your show and, and Thank how you, you ask the question of everybody who, who comes on. Um, for me, I really feel like we are living 
through a, a pivotal time for humanity. And we have made our world so complex and so interconnected that it's dangerous now, um, you know, but there's also incredible positive potential. And I think that humanity as a whole is really being called to rise, to develop ourselves, to really raise our consciousness in order to navigate the world that we've created. And whether you focus on artificial intelligence or climate or food insecurity or whatever the issue is, in order to navigate successfully, all of us need to find a way to get out of that kind of very primitive evolutionary psychology fight or flight way of being into a higher way of being. And I believe that giving is a incredibly powerful pathway for that transformation that needs to happen inside each of us. And so that's okay. the mission that I'm on, you know, and it's why I wrote the book. Uh, it's a huge part of what we do at Building Impact Partners. And, you know, I will feel fulfilled, <laughs> you know, when I know that I'm I'm living out that mission, however much more time I have on this, on this planet. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's the work that I'm called to do. I love that. And it's very unifying, you know, I feel like you talk politics and bipartisan, but but if you're all on a common mission for whatever charity or philanthropy it might be, it's just it's unifying and working together and collaborating and like that that's what it's all about instead of this divisiveness, you know? It's just like let's get together and do something for the good. And that uh, that's the truth of it, that you know, when we do come together as human beings mm -hmm. and, and we're seeking to help others whether thinking about disaster relief, nobody's yeah. talking politics when they're filling sandbags, right? Right. Uh, you know, right. to to prevent a flood in a town or, uh, you know, that that yeah. higher self is, is there. That inside. is when we as a country shine the most, right? That's when we've mm -hmm. all been like, it's when you're proud to be an American when, you, when the, we get together like that around whatever emergency situation there is. It's so true. They're there all the time, right? They are. There's everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm kind of, I'm writing a book and I would love to know how long it took you to write yours because I have like three chapters left of mine and it's painful. Oh yeah. It took me about three years and, and three drafts. Okay, good. I'm 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 on that path. That's not bad. <laughs> it's a labor of love. So thank you for writing it. And I think it's really important work. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate the the close read that you've given to the book and the great questions that you've asked and the mission that you're on. It aligns. I guess see an alignment for sure. So I'll probably be hiring you in the near future. So. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to talk anytime. Um, so I want to say thank you so much for this. And also was wondering if you would let our listeners know where they can find you and where they can buy your book. Absolutely. Well, the book is available on Amazon, Money with Meaning, How to Create Joy and Impact Through Philanthropy. And you can find our business, Building Impact Partners, at buildingimpactpartners.com. Well, this has been a joy. Let's stay in touch. Absolutely. And yes. uh, thank you so much to you and the team. You guys just are such a good operation. All right. You have a good rest of your day. Thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Enjoy Bye. your kids and your time. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>